As Jerry Garcia's lyricist, Robert Hunter wrote some of the most evocative and haunting lyrics for the songs that would become Grateful Dead classics. Hunter recently published his songs in a new book called Box of Rain. In November of 1990, he embarked on a small tour in the Bay Area. At a book signing event at Kepler's Bookstore in Menlo Park, California, Hunter casually fielded questions from deadheads about his early days in Menlo Park, the origins of his songs, and songwriting with Jerry Garcia. Deadhead TV was on the scene for Hunter's rare public appearance. Tonight it is my pleasure to introduce Robert Hunter. Robert Hunter is a poet and lyricist and has a new book out with his complete lyrics, A Box of Rain, and tonight he will answer questions and then will be available to sign books. Please join me in welcoming Robert Hunter. Thank you and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, this vast audio radiance, and welcome again to another session of What Is It? For the next half hour, we're with the cast of them, roughly 123 people. Uh, I'll uh, be glad to take questions, because this is the fun part. Uh, we'll start with you. Where'd you get that tattoo done? <laughs> huh? Different places. Looking good. Looks about 15 years old. Well, do you subscribe to Tattoo Magazine? Yeah. Um, well, I, I just bought my first copy last week, and it's, it's standing tall. Tats are in, folks. I don't have them yet, but soon I got my Harley. And uh, I need to roll. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, how old is your parrot? Two? From an egg. Handsome, does she know any words? May we? <laughs> of course not. Of course not. Ah, okay, uh, next question. How about those Niners, folks? Yeah. And what do you think? What do you think about getting rid of uh, of this uh, act about kneeling down at the end of games? It makes it sound a little too much like a business, don't you think? The next question is: Is that Nikon loaded? Um, the next question. Yes. <laughs> read something for us. Read something for us. No, I'm not going to read because these are lyrics, man. They have to be sung. And if I'm going to sing, then I have to do a sound check, and then I have to have lights. And if I have to have lights to do a performance, then uh, I wouldn't be wanting to do it in a bookstore, would I? Sounds like it. What? Do I know what you're thinking? Yes. I know the fall from Finnegan's Wake and can pronounce that. Just, uh. Baba Badal Garag talking to Ron Khan Brun Tanaran Thundavar Huan Skan Tu Hur Nen and Third Nuck of a once Wall Street old pars retailed in bed and later in life down through all Christian minstrel see the great Paul of the off well Finnegan erstwhile solid man uh, up the hill head of himself promptly went well to the west in quest of his tumty tum toes. <laughs> <laughs> All you have to do is memorize the first page of Finnegan's Wake and they assume you're literate. <laughs> it's a trick. I'm down here because I love the place. First first Kepler's I went to, I guess, was about uh, 12 years old, uh, next to the Guild Theater there. I remember I was, uh, I'd seen Diabolique, which was running there for a year or two. Any of you old Palo Alto people know how long it ran. And stopped next to that little hole in the wall, which has become a very large hole in the wall now. I guess the first song I wrote was when I was about uh, 16 or 17. I had a little band called The Crescents, and I wrote a song called Rock and Roll Moon, which I it didn't include in the book. It went, it's a rock and roll moon tonight, tonight, look at it, baby, it's a beautiful sight. It's doing the stroll along the Milky Way, and as you watch rockin', it seems to say, come a rockin', rockin' with me tonight, come rockin', rock till broad daylight, rock and roll, baby, swing and sway, don't stop, rock till the break of day. Never got anywhere with it, but I, but I did. Uh, <laughs> Seventeen folks, and then uh, Garcia and I wrote a song when I was nineteen, and he was eighteen. Yes, I'm older. I know it's hard to believe. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, so tell you a story about my old man's cat, a cat whose hide was uncommonly black. Fame and fortune and good luck hath the man who crosses the black cat's path. 
And that was, that was our beginning. We didn't write another song for, I guess, about three or four years. <laughs> as dark as a dungeon way down in the mines. Many's the time, walking down from up there, Sand Hill and Santa Cruz Road, like that, walking over to walk over to Kepler's, bring our guitars down, just sit around all day reading books and singing songs. We either came down that way, a um, block or so up, down to Kepler's, or we walked the other direction, yeah, down Sand Hill Road, I guess it was, to St. Michael's Alley, but it's a good place, good place to have uh, had a chance to be in the 60s, I think. I don't know what it's like now. I come down here once in a while. So. Is, that, is it good here still? Yeah. I think what somebody was saying um, in uh, Bab's book, I don't know if any of you've got it, that uh, on the bus book, which is quite good, uh, uh, that he doesn't, uh, he, uh, it's not quoting very very directly here, but he doesn't envy people who were in, the, in Paris in the, in the 20s, he had a chance to be in this area in the uh, in the 60s. And I feel much the same way about it. It's a good place. A lot of stuff came out of here. No, but I remember when uh, <clears throat> when uh, Pigpen wasn't allowed any in, in anymore for writing Vernon Gates sucks on the on the, or at least it was alleged that he had written this. <laughs> I was a waiter at St. Michael's Alley for about a year there, and then I was called out. I was in the guard at the time. Got called out to the Watts riots and uh, didn't subsequently go back. I had no too much experience on me at the time. It was it was fun. Uh, Though, but St. Mike's was important to us. I mean, the, between well, there was a steady track almost between St. Mike's and, and Kepler's. This was uh, this was the genesis of our scene, you know, with the. Uh, oh, well, sure. I could do a trick here. And that, folks, is all I learned in college. <laughs> Uh, no, 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 I learned that on speed, <laughs> not in college. <laughs> well, that was, yeah, that was our, our regular gig. Uh, we had, uh, we start, Jerry and I started out doing a little folk number, and we did over, a, uh, our, we did our first gig, uh, it was May 5th, 19, whatever it was, 60 over at Royal Lounge at, uh, at Stanford. Anybody from Stanford here? One, two people. Yeah, that's two. Well, Hi. <laughs> And uh, and then and then uh, we did our next our next gig at uh, Peninsula School, and uh, I'll bet are there uh, your Peninsula alumni? Yeah, that was a nice place to go to school. I think good place to teach. All right, it's, it's still in operation. All right, uh, what do we do then? Uh, then yeah, we we got uh, we did that for a while, and then and then we. Uh, picked up David Nelson and, uh, and a couple other guys and uh, the Edmondson brothers. We started the uh, a whole series of bands, the Thunder Mountain Tub Thumpers and the Heart Valley Drifters and uh, Badwater Bob and the Badwater Valley Boys. Sung backwards with David Nelson? No, but I've spoken backwards with him. He, I mean, nobody can sing backwards like Dave. I remember he got a... a for some reason I decided to memorize Washington, the Secretary of State, backwards, whatever that could mean. And that, and that was, uh, snapped me Arthur Biesnia Shaw. <laughs> but, uh, Nelson has fondness for, for, for saying things backwards, and uh, more power to him. <laughs> and uh, we actually played down there on Melrose Avenue in L.A. At, uh, I forget the name of the place, but it was a spiffy place to play. And we won uh, a prize at the Monterey Folk Festival. I remember uh, afterwards, everybody who won prizes was uh, um, going to do a gig um, later in the evening in some big hall down there, the hall that they had. And uh, Dylan had been performing that day, and he was sitting real disconsolately on the lawn. They wouldn't let him in. <laughs> he hadn't won, and the place was already full. Yes, this was long ago and far away. And uh, then we, th yeah, then, then we uh, we uh, got the Wildwood Boys together, which is our steady for a long time, which is uh, me and me and Garcia and Nelson and Norm von Maastricht doing bass. And yeah, we played the tangent I guess, almost every weekend for a long time. It's good, you know. We had a, we were we were popular. We draw 
damn near as many people as in this room for a book signing. <laughs> I think uh, of, of anything that I've written that gives, makes me satisfied to have written it, I would say Terrapin Station. There's, some, there's something about that. Uh, I was uh, doing a signing in Berkeley last night. This is my second signing, folks. So there was a, there's a, you've, you've been, uh, uh, and uh, people were asking me, where does that come from? And I, you know, with all the Peggios and the Frenarios and the things that, that come in and out of it. And, and, Best I could think is it goes back to the chateau and, and the tunes that we were playing back then, and some of those uh, mournful, uh, quasi-mystical feels of some of those songs, the Jackaro and, uh, and the Fenario uh, ballads. And uh, you do know what Fenario is, don't you? No, no. Yeah. Well, if you read in in Lomax, uh, the folk songs of North America, Fenario is a four a four syllable generic uh, term uh, for a place uh, in the sticks. And when a songwriter needed a, a, a four syllables, he would use Fenario. If he needed a three syllables, he would use Fibio. This was a tradition. Now you know more than you knew before, unless you knew that before. I did my version for a couple of years, and uh, and I had nice rapport with the audience with it, M much more so than uh, with uh, most new songs that I introduce. Uh, but I think when uh, when Jerry decided to, to reset it, um, I thought he shined his shoes and and uh, made something real special out of it. You know, he, they, the the We Will Survive section like that, you know, has the right changes. It's it's meaty. It's meatier than mine. Mine uh, was more a, a wash, a a, a mood piece. I I wrote it. Uh, about four or five in the morning, I, I think I, I was just still writing it till dawn. I just, you know, was in uh, living on the west coast of England at the time, and it was just sort of describing uh, the kind of feelings you have when you're up all night and you see that paint by numbers morning sky and everything kind of looks cardboard and a bit, a bit, you know, you know the one, kind of, kind of bo burned out. And yet, yet, you know, you're doing okay. And I was writing a song that uh, at that point that was, I had an idea that. Uh, when, when you're writing it, then there's a, another energy to, to counter to counter that. Uh, it's, it's a positive energy. It's got to be. You can't create without some sort of po positive energy coming in. And so, um, you know, from this, uh, it was a time in my life when things were not going terribly right for me. But I was, uh, you know, I figured I would get by. And I just, it was an honest song for me. And I had a lot of stuff. Although, uh, I mean, it sounds so incredibly positive the way the dead do it, and I like that feel to it. I mean, people people have picked up on it as a, an anthem to getting old. Uh, I hadn't even looked at it that way. I just was old. I was. Uh, <laughs> it's nice to get old. I like it. I'd like to get older. The what? I see you got your list out. Oh, my words for that are, I see you got your list out, say your piece and piss off. Uh, as I said, I wrote that in, in England, though, so uh, Jerry decided that was uh, too much of an English expression. And he changed it to, changed it to get out. So there was there was a assonance and alliteration happening within it, and not just concept. List, I, anybody, any kind of paranoia that, that gets a hold of you and has got an agenda, right? That's a list. <laughs> It's about Bristol girls from uh, you know West West Coast. It's about my daughter Jessie here for one. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Jess. And it's about it's kind of about meeting my wife and stuff like that. That's uh, what's that? I was uh, walking around Grosvenor Square. It's in London. So uh, yeah, I lived there for a while. You know, I gave a wonderful answer to that once, that it was a message to, to Jimmy Carter, you know, back <laughs> in those days, uh, until the person I told it to did a little research and realized that Jimmy hadn't been elected when it came up. Uh, the, uh, I don't know, I don't know, you know, it's just, it's, it's jingles and little things that have resonance for me. Hard to say what meaning is in a song, you know, uh, it's like, uh, are, are the meanings that are my meanings, uh, is that meaningful to anyone, you know, from my own life, my own experiences? A song, a, song, a poem, everything has to be resonant to, uh, to other people's meanings. You have, to be able, you have to be able to read into them. This doesn't mean the songs don't have personal meanings to, to me, but uh, I think a lot of the times that's entirely beside the point, whatever it might be about or to me. It's uh, the lost reference. <laughs> Referent. 
That's, this is not cocaine, this is Jerry's bad sinuses, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible sinuses. Have you ever slept in a hotel room with that guy? <laughs> Well, um, yeah, sort of we're working on one. Uh, Mickey came up with a, a real interesting uh, uh, rhythm uh, idea, and um, and I put some words to it, and uh, and then it's been passed on to Garcia. He said yeah to it, so he's going to put some chords to it, something called Corina, and uh, I th feels like the stuff to me. You never know until everybody approves it, but you know I don't think it's okay. It's committee, you know. No, there's there's no there's no specific first. I I, I tend to, uh, uh, as a general rule of the years, to uh, when I'm working with Jerry to deliver him a stack of lyrics for him to search through for what has the best resonances for him, and uh, uh, some of them he'll set straight and quickly. Others he'll quibble with, and we'll get it to it to where we both agree that that, it, that this is the way it goes. And uh, some of the very best ones he's come up with the melodies first, and I've set them afterwards. It's, there's no strict rule any old way. Hey, I think censorship is great, man. I think we ought to, you know, like, uh, I think any, any, any four-letter words ought to be made a capital offense. And, uh, you know, anything risque, anything to do with sex ought to have at least a 20-year term. And then I think maybe we'll rise up and grind those fuckers into the ground. How's that? <laughs> I, um... I, um, the question with censorship is obvious, you know, obvious. Who is going to do it? What cartel and what is, it, what is their agenda? It's, uh, we, we either have a First Amendment or we don't have one. And if we don't have one, our kids are going to hear a lot of stuff that we don't want them to hear. But on the other hand, if we don't hear it, we're not going to hear anything we need to hear. So um, it's got to go. And I think right now I, ha I happen to think that's the battlefield right now. My stuff doesn't happen to be eminently censorable. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's not my taste to be offensive in that way, but if it were my taste, I would like to uh, feel I have the uh, liberty to do it. I'm not against uh, labeling, by the way. Uh, it seems um, it seems some sort of sensible compromise, it, it, except in that it would get to, to the problem of... Uh, of, uh, of uh, stores deciding not to sell what was labeled, which is another sort of censorship. It's a whole can of worms. All we can do is be against it. You know, we it, we ha not to be against it so much as be for the First Amendment. I think. And uh, yeah, there's going to be trouble. There'll always be trouble with with free speech. But we need it, folks. Let's sign some books. Okay.